Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. We've got a special guest today. We're going to look at a really special aspect of trusted leadership. Thank you for being on the show, Jeff Sog. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation, and I love what you're doing with this podcast. Well, thank you. It's uh, it's you know we're basically I just get free advice. I get to get to be yes. and become. I hope get better all the time with with uh, free advice. That I'm sure I'd have to pay uh, thousands and thousands of dollars for. So I'm glad you're on because everybody is going to benefit from you. You're a father of four. You right. are right. When's when's your fourth on the? Uh, That's right. Yeah, in, in April, our uh, fourth baby girl. Yeah. So, so I say father of four now, but yeah, we got to wait till April to meet her. All right. Awesome. <laughs> So you've been a pastor, and today I just want to, it's really exciting. You are the founder of Dad Awesome and Father for the Fatherless. Mm. Give us a few things, you know, three things maybe about Jeff that everybody should know. Oh, man, yeah. So I'm grateful again to be on and grateful. I'm continuing to learn in this theme of trust. How do I be a leader who's trustworthy? How am I a dad that's trustworthy? Uh, a few things maybe that uh, some some of your listeners don't know. I I was a pastor, as you mentioned, for seven years, have felt for a long time, man, I, what if I could go full time and help dads be better dads? Uh, I need to be a better dad every single day. So maybe something your listeners don't know, dad awesome. I, I have given myself full time to this mission of helping dads have shiny eyes and love their role of being a dad so that they might not know another thing i love making rope swings so turning a normal tree into an epic moment with my little girl so i'll give me a rope in any tree and i can make a a decent rope swing and then uh, barefoot water skiing is one of my passions so i love getting out on the lake and uh, i have size 15 feet so it's it's cheating uh, oh. but uh <laughs> they say it's the same as other people skiing but uh, i enjoy getting out in the water that is awesome. Speaking of dad awesome, you know, the, the, the funny thing, I'll tell you really quickly, last person I had the opportunity to go barefoot water skiing with fell, blasted his eardrum, no. and when they pulled him out of the water, he had blood just running out of his ear. So there's the other side of it. Not to, not to you know, that was just, a, that was a visual experience for me because <laughs> they were asking me the whole day, do you want to go barefooting? Because we love to water ski here in Minnesota, right, right. Uh, as you can imagine. Uh, but I was like, I don't think I want to do that. That looks like you fall really hard. Yeah, avoid that type of an injury. It, it, it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is really interesting for our Leaders, you know, we have CEOs and uh, SVPs, and of course, we have women and men, but we can learn something here because, you know, we want to become more and more trusted leaders. And the truth is, I sit next to, I've sat next to presidents of countries and presidents of companies that have imposter syndrome. They w don't want to be found out, N maybe on their leadership at work, but also the leadership, like, I'm able to do this okay, but man, my home front is falling apart. So today we're going to talk about, you know, you've got this, this organization that helps dads be awesome, dad awesome, and fathers uh, to the fatherless or fathers for the fatherless. I, you know, I was thinking of something. I was, uh, had the opportunity to go visit Angola, the, uh, the, the state penitentiary of Louisiana, uh, you know, it, just invited to... <laughs> <laughs> yes, not, right? not long-term visit, it, yes. Just get the whole story here. But I remember talking to the warden, and, and one thing came up. And this was years ago. I might get the statistic barely wrong, but if I'm off, I'm off by less than 2%. I said, of all you know, these folks, what, what's the, is there a commonality, right? What, mm -hmm. What's common to these you know, death row inmates, the, these, you know, is it is it that you know they're on drugs or born in a certain place or a certain color of skin? He said there is a commonality, mm -hmm. and it beats everything else by far. Yeah. And if my memory serves me, he said that every you know you might have fifty percent this, sixty percent that. He said ninety six point eight or ninety eight point six of these that are in here had no relationship or a bad relationship with their father. What say you? Oh man, I mean, it's heartbreaking for all of us. There's no one listening that does, there's not heartbreak attached to kids not having a dad 
who's showing them love, who's showing them how to do these basic things. Like we, we all need a dad and all of us, uh, all of us are waiting for someone to be our guide to help us navigate different seasons, especially those first 18 years. So yeah, the, the statistics around fatherlessness, the epidemic that exists is the reason that I've given, you know, my entire life now to saying, I want to help dads be great dads. Um, it also though, is the reason to focus on not just intentional fatherhood, but the other side, which is the fatherless, because odds are, that whatever you experience, you're going to pass on to your kids someday. So the, these these kids, in, in our case, we help out with orphanages around the uh, on the other side of the globe, and we help out with women's shelters here in Minneapolis. Like these kids are likely going to do this, go the same path. Statistics show that as well. So yeah, the heartbreak is real, and the it's easy for a dad to think I'm doing okay, I'll survive this season. I'm I'm not I'm not breaking my kids' hearts. I'm not causing direct pain to them. But in, on the theme of trust. A trustworthy father that just says, instead of surviving the dad life, instead of making it through, if they turn, they calibrate some dials and say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to prioritize this area of my life because it ripples the home life ripples into, again, whatever the thing is that you're chasing, the other passions, the business, the enterprise, whatever the thing is. So, so my, my, my passion is to help remind dads, be a cheerleader of this is central. And everyone that I interview, because I get to host a podcast as well, everyone in the grandparent season, the, in the 60s, in, in their 70s, all of them say, no matter how intentional they were as a dad, I wish I could go back in my 30s and 40s and turn those dials of intentionality up. So, so yeah, it's heartbreaking, but it's also very possible for for all of us dads to step in to way more intentionality on that front. Well, I think, wait, name the podcast. We'll put it in the show notes. At, sure. Yeah, it's called Dad Awesome. Perfect. So easy to find. Yep. Yeah. And I've had the privilege of being on it, but you'll see that in the show notes. Dad Awesome's easy to find on its own, but uh, trustedleadershow.com. You know, I I brought you on today because you know, we have we have all these leaders, people are, you know, entrepreneurs and business leaders and, you know, moms, dads, influencers. And I think there's a reminder here for everybody. Uh, some on this show listening will feel like, yeah, I didn't have a dad. I didn't have someone fathering me. But others have a great opportunity, mom or dad. They have an incredible opportunity and they're running a great business and they're leading an organization. They might be governors, senators, presidents, uh, but, but they are missing it at home. Mm-hmm. And so, so I want to just pause that. What, what do you tell people? What's a first step? You got these, you want people to be dad awesome or dads to be dad awesome. What, yep. What's a step they can start to take to, to be more intentional? Yeah, because it is just one step at a time. And there's a path. We, t- we talk about being on this path of becoming dad awesome, right? Because no one has arrived and there are no people that are like, I've got this all figured out. But we we think, and from, again, the guests I've interviewed from research, that the first step of being dad awesome, or again, you got moms listening, you got aunts and uncles, that like just being an awesome influence on these, on these kids is to love the role that you've been given. So every dad uh, has been given a role of being a dad. And if they love that role, even it, man, it is hard. It is overwhelming. It is. I, I have. I've multiple times today not shown that I love that role. But if we love being a dad, our kids experience a dad who his eyes are shining, who he, he's being present. If you love the role, then you're going to be a way better dad. So that's where it actually starts. Is is loving the fact that you are a dad, and because what we look for, we find more of. If any anytime we're focused on this thing, it's like you know you you got a car that I'm a Jeep Wrangler guy. Someday I'll have a Jeep Wrangler again. And it, when I'm shopping, if I'm shopping someday for my four door Jeep Wrangler, which is tough with four kids now, I heard there is a conversion kit though, that you can turn <laughs> into a third row. So that, that's a side. You'll spot them though, right? You'll spot them all over on the roads as right. soon as you're shopping for one. You see them everywhere. I didn't know there was that many Jeep Wranglers in Minnesota. So in the same way, if you're looking for opportunities to really find that joy, find the shiny eyes to engage because you love being a dad. Uh, so that's, that's one side of a first step. So let's jump, let's take a step back from that because I know, I know leaders, I walk with leaders, I consult with and coach privately leaders that share with me, you know, they, they love their job, they love their work, they're passionate yes. about their work, they actually in their heart want to be a good dad, mm-hmm. but they don't love it. Right. So right. how do you, you say, oh, just love it, come on, just, just, just love that role, when they actually don't love that role, especially yep. in certain periods of time. Some yeah. would say when they're you know, six months old, some might say teenagers, but sure. they want to do a good job, they want to leave a great legacy, but they just do not love it. How can they start to love it? How can yeah, they be part a- of 
part of why I think parents sometimes don't love the role, the season they're in, is because there's no immediate results, especially for guys. You're looking for a quantifiable Q1 this year. What what am I going to accomplish? And and I have I've had long periods, six months, twelve months, eighteen months with with some of my daughters that I'm like I'm not seeing the breakthrough in any tangible way. Like oh I've clicked a few notches better. I'm more dad awesome today than I was, or I'm enjoying it more. So because of that deferred um, deferred outcomes or deferred like I hit a goal or I'm moving forward that you get on the business front, you get in the workplace. Uh, I think we have to commit to increasing the hours that we're connecting with their hearts, that we're present with them, that we're playing with them. I think play is huge. I think everyone is a better person if they play more often. So no matter what your profession is, what it, industry you lead within, if you play more, if you have an area that you play, that you laugh, that you're, again, you're pre- something about play. And there's a lot of research around this topic that I'm still researching more on. Um, if we, if we commit as dads to play twice as much as we did last year, this coming year with our kids, that, that might only mean that you, you increase a little, look for a few more moments to play with your kids. If you play more, you'll love, pl- you'll love being a dad more. Like if you just play with your kids more. So there's a little bit of, we have to choose before we see the outcomes, the, the inputs. And in this case, it's time. And if you double up as a dad, we talk about doubling down, double down in your dad life. If you double down and you go from a two hour per day dad to a four hour per day dad, and there's stats that most dads are less than both those. But if you went from two hours to four hours over the course of 18 years, you gain 13,000 more hours of time inputting, you know, your, your, all that you have as far as your wisdom, your connection, your guidance. Um, so that's, that's our hope is that dads double down, gets the extra 13 hour, 13,000 yeah. hours, and then they will love it more if they, if they, so let's that get, dial. let's get real for the folks listening too. And I, I know I, you know, some people would say I'm very in, pretty intentional. I was intentional yeah. about some things I do with my kids growing up. And I, I'm so grateful for these, these four kiddos and, and an amazing wife, which has helped me be a, a better dad, at least. And there's certainly challenges. I can tell you a conversation I had with a teenager last night that I don't think I did, uh, <laughs> did actually sure. very well. So um, I'm not perfect at any of this stuff. But what about someone like me that, and you know, until COVID, you're flying 200 flights a year or uh, you know, 190 flights a year uh, around round trip, maybe 100 flights a year, and you feel called to this work, uh, for me, uh, increasing trust around the world from corruption issues to uh, pro sports teams to presidents of companies, and you feel called to that. You're not there. Certainly, I have some regrets early on. Um, I, I changed some things, so I started flying kids with me. So they see, how do you treat the flight attendant? How do you do this? Mm-hmm. I started doing something where I, I uh, video my kid, send a video encouragement, a little Bible verse and an encouragement to my kids every morning when I was on the road, and it's they incredible. would open it and be excited about it. Yep. Um, and, you know, and some things lasted for a time, like that that kind of thing. Once some of more older teens, um, I had to do some different things. But but what do you do? Like I I, I could say, well, I'm just going to not have my job. I'm not have this calling. I'm not going to do this thing. But I, you have to be traveling. You have to do these things. How do you be intentional in the midst of, for some listening, the very high demand. Mm-hmm. Uh, roles that they have. You think of a senator listening that has to be in D.C. however many days a year, and yet we're grateful that we have some good senators, some might argue with me here, but some good congressmen and women, you know, in office pushing uh, for good in the world. You know, what are, they, what are we going to do? Yeah, so and I, I believe you know Greg McEwen wrote the book Essentialism. And thinking around what are the things that are truly essential and within the scope of life. So you could say, again, as we talk with people that are two decades, three decades older than me, they would say, yep, dad life is essential. It was an area that if I put inputs there, they ripple effect out into making me more effective in these other areas. Now, back to your travel question, taking the essentialist approach to dad life, I, I do believe you can, you can while traveling, like some of the examples you shared, you can, you can maximize heart connection with your kids, maximize moments of encouragement and affirmation, words uh, spoken over them that really guide them in the right way, using FaceTime, <laughs> using Zoom, using uh, notes, text messaging, but also in your home, uh, really, if we believe that this is the, one of the most important roles that we have, if we believe it, um, and if we believe it actually affects our um, our life in our 60s, 70s, 80s, I do, and I do believe this, that by the focuses, the deposits that I'm making today, the joy level that I'm going to experience and walk in in my 60s, 70s, 80s, versus so many, you hear so many hard heartbreaking stories, people in their 60s, 70s, 80s with so much regret, so much heartbreak and pain and and, uh, conflict between kids and grandkids. Uh, So that's where I would say fight 
not not don't cheat the job to to be a great dad. I don't think being dad awesome means you have to fail in the in the, the other place. In fact, I think awesome dads thrive because they've done what's essential and that has spilled into Greg McEwen talks about protect the asset our physical body because this if you, if this fails, all the other things fail. I think almost in the same way, your family on the home front, if you don't protect that by carving the time, uh, it will ripple into you and other areas will become toxic because you've got that going on in the home and you care so deeply for these kids and if the kids are uh, and not again, not that if you would do the right inputs, you don't still have pain or struggle or you're perfect on the home front. But that would be me like talking back around the travel side. I love yeah. it. And of course, it it was, you know, it's something I've changed. I've changed how I've done it. I've changed how much I've done it. And not just because you know, we had frameworks uh, in place even when I was traveling more in those last several years. But I remember early on, you know, when I started my first business in 1999, I came back from being director of an organization and we poured everything we had into it. You know, for two years, I lived in the basement of 86-year-old Clara Miller's black mold, no windows, bathroom or kitchen. And it was illegal. We didn't even know it was illegal. Lisa and I lived there. We, had, we figured, you know, we basically were down to $1.40 to our name after paying our urgent bills that first October. And we thought it, it, it was a thing of, we, we'll take anything we can get for work, right? And of course, things changed over time and over the years, but we l- kind of lost everything a couple different times. And so I, I, then I started being more, what you could say, in a way successful, and then you're traveling more, but, but you kind of had this fear thing of like, oh, I better do that to provide for the family. And I think People can get in this trap of they're gone to provide without providing the emotional and leadership support and spiritual support that needs to happen. And once, you know, that's a big wake up call for some of us that, you know, um, those are just as important as physical needs. Yeah, and I think most of our dads, most of our parents and grandparents, the provider side was the primary. Like that was you're rocking it as a dad if you can do the providing side. And we're just I think we're just realizing cultures even embracing that present dads, dads that are connecting, dads dads that are doing one-on-ones with their sons or their daughters like to the playground. Like those are it's generally applauded by our culture today, which is so good, but we didn't have any example to follow because right. li- likely we didn't see that from our parents. Hey, it's Ann with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true to life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. All right, let's jump over to the producer. Kent, what question do you have today for Jeff Zog? So I was wondering um, if there's maybe a leader you were talking about, like there's a lot of people that maybe didn't have a good um, father figure in their life. Now they're a father. How can they, like who can they turn to? Like who are people that, how can they find like maybe other people that are great dads that could help kind of show them how to be a good dad when they haven't really had that example before in their life? Yeah, great question. Because I mean, if we're trying to figure this out from scratch, we're in we're in huge trouble. So I, I love your question, Kent. And the the hope is through mentoring, but through peer mentors. For me, it's peer mentors and it's mentors that are a couple a decade, two decades ahead of me, or even just older kids. That'd be peer mentors with just a little older kids. But I think so. Brotherhood, friendships. If we don't have, and I have this in my neighborhood. I have a dad right over the fence that I'm like, he's in so many ways. I've learned so much just by watching these interactions moments. So I think if we have a lens on of we're gathering and we're um, we're trying to gather the best of what we're seeing again from these mentors, you can do it from books, from podcasts as well. But intentionality, I, I found myself with a four year old daughter. I had listened to zero podcast on fatherhood, on being a better dad read zero books, had met with zero mentors on the topic specifically of fatherhood. I was chasing uh, growth in the area of entrepreneurship and leadership and management and personal finance and I was fitness, all these other areas, but I wasn't in my dad life. And I think that's the case for a lot of a lot of us. We could forget on the parenting side to put intentionality of taking that person out to coffee or setting up a Zoom call or reading a book. Like there's ways to pursue both peer mentors around the topic of fatherhood and mentors down the road, but we have to carve the time and we have to 
pursue that. So that's probably the biggest thing I'm a cheerleader for. I'm like, man, if you have a friend circle that you can learn from and you're learning from people a step ahead, I mean, you're you're going to be just fine. Okay. Yeah. Just dads that say I'm going after it are going to, are going to really calibrate in a positive way. Having a band of brothers or sisters, uh, in life, um, for, for, for guys, probably a band of brothers, but I'm going to come back to that in a, in a moment, but it, this reminds me of something somebody said to me a long time ago and, and parenting and marriage are similar. Um, a mentor of mine said, if people would spend as much on their marriage in the first five years as they do on the wedding day, their That's marriage it. would be better. They go into this, they don't learn, they haven't really um, done a deep study on marriage, and yet that's going to be a huge, massive, most important relationship in their life. And by the same token, on parenting, people go to Lama's class and they spend time on this, you know, um, the, the birth, like we got a birth plan. We got that baby's coming out a lot of times either way, right? That's going to happen, whether it's perfect or not. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I should, you know, with, with gratitude to my wife <laughs> yeah. for the, for the, for the huge, massive effort and pain. But I mean, I'm just saying that's going to happen. The bigger pain is the next, you know, 18 or more or, or hundred years. Right. So, um, yeah. if we, I, I think he said, if you would spend as much time on your parenting as you do on the birth, you will have a chance at winning at parenting. Right. Yes, yes. The compounded interest analogy for me is massive because I, I was given a gift about three quarters of my college education by my grandpa. Amazing, generous gift. And uh, that amount of money, though, uh, if I would have instead of paying for college, if I would have put that money into Apple stock in 2001, uh, here we are eight, 19 years later, that money would be it's like 17 million dollars, the $60,000. Right. So I if, if I would have known that in hindsight, the compounded impact of that financial financial decision of just take the loans out and work them off and invest here, right? Um, but we know this in parenthood. We know that as parents, the compounded impact of investing the time and the heart and the education and the learning and the online course or whatever the things are, we know the compounded impact is like an Apple stock. It, it ripples into our kids and our kids' kids, and we just we just know it. And anyone we talk to in their 70s will say that is the Apple stock. It's putting our time there versus other pursuits, other areas. But again, because because most of us think we're not doing a good job as a dad, I feel that way all the time. We we kind of just try to survive it, and that's again just me cheering on that it's it is the compounded impact. It is the it's the gold mine. It's the Apple stock. I love it. So. Um, a couple things I you know, think about is I want to get better as a dad. I want to get better as a husband. I want to get better as a leader all the time. So we started right our second year of marriage. We started going to marriage conferences, and it's been a good little... Um, you know, kind of jolt every every time we do to help us be better. We've gone to things uh, as far as parenting from connected families to others. I think you have something, and not to put an advertisement in here, we didn't talk about that. But but um, what 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 do you do to help dads? You know, get better. Yeah, so we have, I mean, a couple opportunities on the dad awesome side of, of, of just resourcing. We created a framework, a four-part framework for fatherhood, and it's uh, it's called the adding life to the dad life framework. It just spells life. So I I am loved just that, hey, we have to start with just knowing. And if we love our, there's all kinds of research on this. If we if we know that we are loved, we're going to pass more love along. So, so I'm loved. I am intentional. I am free. So free from just past man, past struggles, things that pull us back the other direction. And then I am engaged. So we have a four part framework again to help in, invite dads into our goal is at the end of that four step framework. You can find this at dadawesome.org is to see a dad who truly enjoys being a dad, which is where we started the first question. So I, yeah, that framework. And then, and then we have a bike ride, a hundred mile bike ride that we invite people into uh, dads into. I'm committed to going right <laughs> next yes, you're this coming. coming you're... one. I, I made the commitment. Oh. So well, we're, we're thankful. I mean, we're in Washington, D. D we're in Philadelphia, New York, Cocoa Beach, Florida, Minneapolis, Denver. We're all over the place now, these rides. But you're doing the Minneapolis one where we're mobilizing dads to ride their bikes 100 miles for kids that don't have a dad. Fathers for the fatherless. And we're, our prayer, our goal is to raise a million dollars this year for the fatherless. Well, so. we, we should, we're going to help you do that. And so I hope Let's we go. blow it away. But uh, I'd love to 
bike alonging inside anybody that would like to do that next August 28th, I believe yeah, it is. So uh, you can find that on the site. And uh, I made that commitment also. So let's jump back to something I think is important, no matter who you are as a leader, no matter if you're a mother or a father, but this is critical to being a great leader or a great father, and that's mentorship or kind of finding this group of guys. And I think, you know, I, I shared it on your podcast, a massive part of any success that I enjoy um, is because of four guys. We started, uh, I think it was 27 or 28 years ago in college, junior year, uh, you know, meeting together every Thursday night and asking questions, spurring each other on. How are you? How are you treating that in those days? That girlfriend? Are you? Are you being the gentleman you want to be? How are you doing with that leadership? And now we're all running companies or organizations, and uh, and but we still meet every single year for five days. We sharpen each other. It's not just to go have fun up at a cabin in northern Minnesota. It is go up to a cabin in northern Minnesota, but we, we spread, how are you doing as debt? We kind of have these, it, it changes a little bit, but we have had about 54 questions that each dad, each guy answers for about three or four hours each. So you think of all that time, get through a guy a day or whatever it is. And then we do some fun stuff too, but that time has been monumental for us staying the course, both what we would say on stage and off stage in our business. For me, I often have a literal stage, but whatever your stage is as a leader, That's it's right. it's kind of how how we how we staying the course on stage and off stage at home with our kids. Uh, I'm not perfect at all, but I can tell you the best of me is largely because of that group of guys that have helped me stay the course. So I can't kind of encourage enough that point of having a group, uh, a team, an accountability group. And of course, for business, I have a different kind of mastermind group. And for, you know, there's some of these other groups we can be a part of that help us sharpen each other. But that's been monumental to me. Uh, what can you say to encourage people to find a group like that if they don't have one where they can be authentic and open and um, where it can be valuable? Yeah, because I mean that just like you know you hear about people, uh, the the it can feel like you're almost back to like a dating or like, like it, it can feel intimidating to go make a deeper friendship. I, I know a lot of people that have said I tried the softball team, I tried that thing, and and it, it's awkward because you put yourself in a spot where you want to pursue a friendship. Let's get together and play disc golf. Let's do this thing, and and it's not reciprocating. It's like oh man, I guess I'm not a good friend. I I encourage when it comes to forming deep friendships, the most easy, low pressure way to find some, you know, another, another dad, another guy, another, a friend is to pursue peer mentors. So when you find someone that you're like, Hey, it's a, it's a neighbor down the road, or it's a colleague that you want to just get to know a little more to see, Hey, could we be mutually encouraging each other to, to become better dads, better leaders, more trustworthy? Um, I encourage find something about their life that you want to learn from. So it's their parenting. It's their, uh, Hey, they're good at doing home projects, construction skills skills, their carpentry, it's their, um, they do triathlons and you, you're interested in doing a triathlon. So you ask that person to sit at your campfire or to have a phone call or to grab a cup of coffee, a one-time ask for a small amount of time around one specific topic it takes all the pressure down because now they've already, they feel honored and like you respect them and you think they're a good dad or you think, Hey, they're good on the personal finance side or whatever the area of life that you want to learn state it, ask them for that time. And then after that, you've had that conversation, come back around. So this is almost, it feels like I'm giving dating advice, right? But it's <laughs> not, it, it works because then a month later or six weeks later, you reach out again. Hey, can we just grab a cup of coffee again? You want to go shoot some hoops, talk again? I'd love to learn more from you. What you find though, is as you pursue learning and you reciprocate back, they see you're taking action in the areas they're encouraging. They actually feel great about yeah. themselves because they're like, I'm helping someone. And I did that with my closest circle of friends over the course of a year, five buddies. And then I brought the group together and we started cooking breakfast together at 530 in the morning and we formed a group and uh, the, it didn't cost much. One guy brought a dozen eggs each week and we made eggs and we, we talked about life just like the group you have. But it took a year of me intentionally pursuing those guys. And those are the guys that put their arm around me and cried with me this last year. My my dad went home to heaven. So he died this last year. And this group of guys carried me. They brought food for my family while I was up in northern Wisconsin driving back and forth in the last month. Um, it was it changed everything about the trajectory of how I went through hardship because of this group of guys. But it took it, it did not happen accidentally. Yeah, I, I just can't 
emphasize this enough that that this Mm. we so often see people thinking independence especially guys i'm doing it on my own i'm a Mm -hmm. i'm self-made nobody's self-made the research shows by the way and uh this whole idea this ego that we do it on our own it's it's not the way forward and so i love that i love that by the way uh, uh, another thing is what you just said about mentorship programs like i think the reason most mentorship programs fail in companies is because there's this massive commitment ahead of time. Like, am I even going to like that person? I've got to sign up for 12 sessions or whatever. It's like, I love this idea of just, hey, go out once. You can be mentored in a moment, one time. And then if it leads to something else, great. and might be an ongoing thing, but um, take the pressure off. And uh, I, I, I love that idea. What are, you, what are you doing right now to learn and grow yourself? Yeah, I've... I would say in a few categories, I audible has been a game changer. So my listening to books has been a game changer over the last few years, but I've tried to go about one for one reading and listening, reading a paper book and listening. So I would say on the learning side, it's been in that category of, of books. And, uh, and then on the other sides of just growing, I, I think jumping in an area that I'm over my head and learning as I go, my podcast is an, is, is an example of that. I mean, starting a new nonprofit organization is an, so j- just putting myself always at the edge of what's comfortable, or actually I, I take leaps past where I'm comfortable. Cause I, I just know that I'm going to get, I'm going to learn so much by doing that. And I'll be desperate for mentorship. I mean, I reached out to you, what, two months ago, I was like, I just need an hour of your time to talk about this and this and this. Um, so I would say I'm in that place of often I'm in over my head and I need help from others. And uh, then I try to on the consistent side of the reading, learning. So probably those two sides, maybe the last one I'd mention is I try to get alone to a cabin in the woods about once a quarter to just take long walks and to take time to, uh, I slept 13 hours this last one. I just went up a, a week ago to a place called Wilderness uh, Fellowship in, in, in Wisconsin. And the, the idea of just silent retreat time, slow it down, maybe bring a book, maybe just a journal and take that long hike, sometimes fall through a hole in the ice in a bog, which may have happened. It was a little <laughs> bit cold, uh, but the uh, slowing, that's just very countercultural right now yep. to, to, to take time away from the hustle. But I think that's the investment that multiplies into effectiveness and clarity in so many other areas of life on the home front and on the work side. So, so yeah, that, yep. that would be another encouragement. You know, uh, that makes me think of something just for the first time popped up in my head, a mentor of mine, Sherm Svensson through college. So you know, the pre many don't know this. They think Target just came out of nowhere, but Target Corporation used to be Dayton Hudson Corporation. Okay. okay. And those of us in Minneapolis know the Dayton's downtown. And Dayton's was the big, you know, the big store. It was, it was, it was a, a massive company, seven different business units. The the big uh the CEO of Dayton Hudson Jewelers and Dayton Hudson this and Dayton Hudson that. And uh so Sherm at the time he got asked to be CEO of just one of those seven. At the and he was at Dayton Hutchins Jewelers. He was a CEO now, and I re, the the you know he's like I gotta make my pl- I gotta do my stuff. And the overall CEO said to him after one year at the job, said, um, "How many days have you taken off?" He said, Sherm, Sherm said none. Like I, I'm here, I'm all in. And the CEO said, "Do you think I'm doing a bad job?" The overall CEO said, "No, no, sir. Uh, you, you think I'm not doing everything I need to do?" No, do you think I'm not present? No, he said, then how is it that I'm able to take every single day of my seven days of vacation, uh, seven weeks, seven weeks of vacation, and you couldn't take a single vacation and you call yourself a CEO. And from that day, Sherm, Sherm, by the way, later became the CEO of Dayton Hudson Corporation overall, right before it became Target. Wow. He was an amazing CEO. He gave his time at the university that I'm on the board of now, but um, in his later years to be the CFO, uh, basically voluntarily. And that's where I was very fortunate to be one of very few students to be mentored by him. But I remember later, as when he became, by the time he became CEO, of all of Dayton Hudson, he said every spring and every fall, he takes two weeks. Now, not everybody can do this, right? Sure. At his home on the beach in Florida. And he said that I take and I have the same rhythm of those four weeks. I get up in the morning. I get up an hour later than normal, five in the morning instead of four in the morning. I go for a walk on the beach, always with my notebook. And then I read all morning. And then in the afternoon, I spend with my wife and we golf and go out for a dinner. Mm -hmm. I go to bed early. I come in. I read. I get up in the morning an hour late. I walk on the beach. I read all morning. 
And uh, he said that time is what gave him some of the best ideas to deal with the big challenges. So that wow. that time of getting away, I think, is critical. And, you know, I I practice that to some degree. I'm always yeah. learning to practice things more, but I've had some amazing sure. times away that have uh, led to great things and I've certainly needed and even have helped me solve mm-hmm. things. So it's this is kind of fun because getting away is important. A community is important. They seem like opposites, but they're not. You kind of need both. Yep, yep. I, I'm i such a fan. I mean, George Washington Carver is another example, just legendary example of taking walks in the woods and all of his breakthroughs came from the walks. Yeah, so I yeah, think, lots of... Right, right. Yeah. Prime Minister Churchill, I think he was uh, mm-hmm. known for... Um, uh, what did they... What did he... He called it uh, learning by walking around. Yeah. So he'd go... <laughs> he'd go... Something like that. So, um, interesting. Well... Let's uh, let's move into here. I want to talk about your is the nonprofit Father for the Fatherless. Yes, I mean, right now both. We're not sure if it'll be two organizations or one, but Fathers for the Fatherless is the yeah is this mission of activating dads to raise money and awareness for kids without dads. So Fathers for the Fatherless around bike rides and runs. We'll do a run this year as well. Uh, in fact, I, I I think it could become more than that, but just dads need something to do versus let's process our thoughts and our feelings. So so that's where we're, we're just like, let's engage dads, help them plug into that mission. Uh, when, when a dad is plugged into a mission and doing something hard, their kids notice something's different about my dad. He's not just going to work and coming home and surviving. So, so that's the whole point is to kind of stoke up a fire of being on mission as a dad and accomplish something potentially the hardest thing that dad has done uh, since they became a dad could be the 100 miles and the kids get to cheer him on see him see him suffer see him sweat and they know that hey it's not just because dad wants to be in good shape but he's doing it for kids that don't have a dad i love it and speaking of shape you're in great shape and you know my story i lost 52 pounds in five and a half months at one point and uh it it made a huge difference in my life i was an athlete in college and before and then um you know started writing books and leading in some ways and some things changed and i said i gotta change something but how do you stay fit Oh man! Well, I mentioned rope swings right at the at the front, right? The good rope swing. Uh, sometimes you have to throw that that rope up and over like fifty times to get it over the branch. <laughs> no, it's uh, I, I do think activity with the family is part of it. So so b- by taking the girls out, putting all three in a sled and towing them around the block a few times. Uh, now I do early morning walks. I try to get out at five twenty a.m. Get out for a two mile walk in the morning. So just fresh air first before screens is a principle that I learned from a mentor. Um, the the staying in shape though is not a gym membership that you can see the bike behind me I do have uh, a bike on a little trainer so I, I can in the winter time cycle overall though I would not say health and fitness is like a central passion of mine but I love being active and playing so if I can make it play versus make it grind it out then I stay active and stay in shape so that's that's the key for me or the other principle is find something that I don't know much about put myself in the edge of scary and then I have to like I have to train enough to to stay healthy doing it. So if I commit myself to something with some other brothers, yeah. that uh, that nudges me forward. So those commit, are the commitments kind of huge. Like when I yeah. commit to a triathlon, I got to, oh man, I got to get ready for it. Even though I don't like to yep. really, I don't really like love to swim, run or bike. Yep. But for some reason, you know, that commitment, I, that was funny. The one of, that brings back to, uh, for me, one of the motivations for the, the weight loss. And of course I had to figure out a way to do this ongoing. Now it's been a decade. Um, so that's good. But I, um, I said to my staff at the time, I shook hands in front of people. If I don't lose this weight, I'll give you each, I'll uh, give you, t- uh, what was it, $2,500. You remember this? Yes. And I, I said, this, and, my, I, and I, that was, I didn't have much money at the time. This was like, I'm like, you know, and my wife's like, what are you doing? But I knew if I said it out loud and I made a commitment, I would figure out a way uh, mm-hmm. because I knew I couldn't be paying this $2,500, you know, to people um, for not making that commitment. And basically, I, I, to make that commitment, I had to lose uh, 40 pounds which, uh, yeah. you know, then I kept going a little bit because I learned it would be healthier to have a little more off. But but um, I <laughs> but made it by knew. three pounds. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and you knew, though, that that money, you knew, one, you were going to follow through because it's yeah. a big dollar amount. You can't afford it. You got to right. follow through. Yeah. But also, I mean, the investment of our health, I, I mean, th- that ripples into what energy it ripples in. Our marriage is going to be healthier. Our kids are like we just know that that side of stay active, stay fit. Do not let that area go because that area will ripple into every uh, every other area. So that's huge. That's You've huge. inspired me, though. I, I don't love to run. I'll do certain things. Um, there's some things that but bringing it into something I like, like I, I just want to think about, 
you know, is there a way I could get back to playing basketball with people that are, you know, an older group that uh, sure. would do that? Because I just love that. And I've been played for a decade, but doing something I love, that would get me up. That would get me excited about it. And, um, yeah. you know, like some people like to play golf. Um, I love to fly fish or whatever. You know, finding something I love sure. with sure. it um, would be fun to do more. So. Find something you love uh, to do or something that can be playful, and uh, it seems like it sticks a lot better, and that makes sense. Yeah, I love All it. All right. Hey, this has been great. There's so much more we could ask, but let's get to the lightning round because it's time. So right, quick questions, up. quick answers. What's your favorite book or resource right now or one of them? So I'm reading, and I know he's another guest of yours, but I'm reading Win the Day by Mark Batterson. And it's, it's, it's messing with me. And it's messing in some of the themes of grief and how we take what's happened in the past of hardships and we activate that towards something good that we actually don't have to let it hold us back. There's a new beautiful path forward, even if there's loss. So Win the Day, it's about daily disciplines. Mark Batterson. He's got several great books and we're excited to have him on. He's booked and going to be on before long, but um, that's... Uh, Phenomenal. He's not just a guy that writes books and cranks out books. He's a guy that writes books that has something to say in yeah, every yeah. one of them, something different, something inspiring and something valuable. So mm-hmm. super excited about that. What's something you can't live without? So got it right here. A good cup of coffee. I mean, I, I do the pour over. I, I, it's kind of late crazy. here in the day for this. We're I recording. I mean, you're just you're, I, you're you're you're. Is it an all day long thing? It, it, well, and it's 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 bad. I'm drinking some really good coffee, fragment <laughs> coffee in the North Loop. I, I brewed it up, uh, did my pour over Chemex, and yes, so coffee is is pretty high on the list. I can't live without. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Best advice or quote, man? If you want to change the world. Go home and change your kids' lives, and they'll change the world. Mother Teresa, yeah, that quote. One, I love it. Want to change your world? We got to say that. Say that real clear again. Yeah. Do you want to change the world? Go home and uh, change the lives of the, the, the. It's go home and change the lives of your family, like your kids and your wife. Yeah, yep. that's how you change the world. I love it. One thing left on your bucket list. I have not spoken this publicly. It's time. I, I want to do. I want to accomplish an Ironman. Yeah, so I, I wanna I wanna knock off the Iron Man. I, I think it's my daughter's gonna be a little older, but it's it's on the bucket list, and I have not I have not. The thing about the Iron yet. Man is you talk. This is it's a time. It is a commitment. I know several Massive. people, and you know, even when my wife's doing marathons, it's like that's a ton of time. So you try you put these things together: running a company or an organization, doing a doing a twenty hours a week of training for a triathlon, and trying to be a good dad. This mix gets challenging. Uh, but that's, that's the mix, right? I think it's older when they're in high school, junior high, so they can bike along with me when I, so I think there's some participation while I run their biking or their kayaking next to me swimming. I think that's the way it's going to happen. Right. Put one on your back while you swim those two miles. Yeah, there we Uh, go. (laughs) Well, I have a goal. Mine is to to do the half in Kona. I'd like, I'd let's do it together. Just the half try. Yeah. All right. Half Half try, I think I get there, but all right. Half Ironman, you said. I mean, half Ironman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a bigger step. Yeah. Yeah. Much, (laughs) much bigger. Yeah. So I got a little bit to do, but that's something, um, I'd be motivated by. So, hey, where can everybody hear about, learn more about you? We'll put it in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. Where, where, where can we find out about you and connect? Yeah, the easiest way is dadawesome.org. So just dadawesome.org. And uh, I would love to, yeah, just welcome any of your amazing audience to engage in more of the intentional fatherhood resources that we create. That'd be amazing. And we don't promote many other, you know, things on this on this podcast, but I'm so passionate about fatherhood too. I think, and I, I just think what you're doing is so amazing and tremendous. And I think we often think of how are we going to change the world with our mission, in our case of developing trusted leaders and organizations around the world or or in 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 whatever it is we're called to do. But man, if we if we're a dad, a father, or a mother and not doing that role well, we are doing a disservice to the world. And our greatest legacy is in those at home. And so um, I'm just, I'm grateful for the work you're doing. And I'm, I'm so happy to share it with the world because I believe this is really the way to trusted leadership ongoing. So, hey, it's the Trusted Leader Show. So it's the last question for you. Who is a leader you trust and why? Yeah, so my, he was my youth pastor, Mel Ellenwood, is now running a church planting organization in Eastern Europe. And he, 
he showed, this is why I trust him, is he said, he saw something in me and said, uh, I want to invite you into, in this case, it was playing the acoustic guitar and leading songs, leading worship. But he ch- saw something in me and made my eye shine by welcoming me into that place. And I will forever trust him because he showed that he believed in me. And he's never, he, you know, he hasn't let me down on the side of broken trust. But I, I often, if people say, who's that leader that really affected the trajectory of my life? Mel Ellenwood, uh, Joe Josiah Ventures is the organization he runs. And uh, it's because, again, and we can do this to people in our lives, we can find someone, see something, just a glimmer of something in them, and we can speak way more life over them, and we can we can give them opportunities, lift them up, and uh, it will send them on a different trajectory. And that's uh, so that's why I trust and appreciate him. I love it. My wife has a saying, and it's affected me a lot, and it's affected our our, our parenting, and, and I wish I would be better at it consistently. But she says... See the good, say the good, share the good. Yeah, yeah. So if you see a kid doing something good, see a, a, a friend, a, an employee, see, say that. You know, you can speak life into them. I think uh, Brene Brown said what? if you, they have to, People have to feel like they belong before they believe differently, before they'll behave differently. Mm-hmm. And it's like, see that good, share that good, and you have a chance. I have a chance at changing the tra- trajectory of others. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know what? Jeff, you've made me better. You've made me a better dad and a better person, and I just thank you for that, and I thank you for our relatively new but um, growing friendship. And so um, thank thank you so much for having me on. Honor to join you, and uh, love everything you're doing. I'm cheering for you. Well, thank you. Likewise, it's been the Trusted Leader Show. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, stay trusted.